Good morning, friends, wherever you might be, and um, welcome to today's uh, cichlids, cichlids and coffee, <laughs> and wherever you are, I hope you're having a cup of your favorite beverage, whatever that might be, and um, if it is coffee or tea, I hope it's out of one of these cups here. Boy, that's a good cup of coffee. So um, welcome, everybody. Let's let a few more folks get onto the stream here, and we will get underway. And um, I decided to sit at this angle today so you folks could take a good look here at the 210-gallon, uh, how everybody's doing. And uh, they seem to be doing okay. The, even the, uh, the killer Eureka Red... The killer Eureka Red Jake is behaving for the most part, even though he has claimed he has claimed the uh, the sort of cave area as his realm, and that you know that that kind of brings up the case of um, running a cichlid tank with no decor, which you see folks do that because they don't want the fish to have anything to claim, or do you run it uh, decorated the way I do because I like breaks in the line of sight, I like hiding spots. And I like the look of a decorated tank. I mean, that's that's a topic I guess we could get into even in, a, in a, an entire video. But there is a sort of a, a two two camps, two different camps in the African cichlid community. One that likes to run the tanks free of decor, very very lightly decor, because of the idea that a fish will claim something, like like the Eureka has claimed this area here, and the folks who simply run it decorated and don't care but stock it so heavily that the damage is uh, is really spread out which is what i'm shooting for here i have uh, more fish coming in from the uh my friends at the cichlid shack there'll probably be another maybe i don't know between five and ten more fish in this tank and um so it's going to be spreading spreading around uh quite a bit so um let's see here Zen Ginger. Hey, Zen Ginger. Welcome today. Thank you for your moderator help. I appreciate that. Zen Ginger promoting that you hit the like button if you haven't already. GP is here. Hey, GP. Glad you're here. Hey, Jerry. And uh, Jerry's Fish Room. Be sure to check out Jerry's Fish Room on YouTube. And uh, he's working on the resealing of a very large tank. He's got some fun projects going on there. Check them out. Jerry's Fish Room on YouTube. And... Uh, so welcome, my friends, and let's go ahead and get back to the uh, main scene here, and let's go ahead and do the official start of the live stream. If you're new to the channel, be sure to hit that sub button. If you feel you're getting something out of it, uh, hit the notification bell and also, of course, the like. And I thank you for that. We're getting really close to uh, 40,000 subs, which um, if you had told me that was possible a year and a half ago, I would have laughed uncontrollably. But we're getting close, and I, I like it. I like it. It uh, didn't seem possible before. Uh, some quick shout-outs to uh, the channel sponsor, The Cichlid Shack. And we have some new discount codes for the Cichlid Shack. I think I announced them last week. You can get 10% off regardless of the size of your order on food and supplies by using uh, Shack Attack 10. And on fish orders over 100, uh, that go over 100, you, you do get a 15% discount. Use Shack Attack 15. And uh, I love helping out the privately owned fish providers out there like James Largo over at the Cichlid Shack. Also, um, I, I've got to I've got to throw out a big uh, a big thank you to last week's uh, super chatters, and um, you know Leo Contreras, Ricky De Hoyos, Deb Tech, Jerry's Fish Room, and uh, and Naomi H two O, Naomi H two O, blew me away with their super chat. Thank you so much, Naomi. Thank you to all of you, and Naomi, I was so. Um, uh, flabbergasted, so overwhelmed that I forgot to tell you that if you would like a towel, a towel and some stickers, any Super Chat really over $20, if you want a towel and some stickers, let me know. 
Here's uh, some channel stickers and an aquarium co-op towel. Best, best towel in fish keeping. <laughs> Be sure to uh, let me know. And uh, if you if you would like that, by sending me a uh, email to uh, Ben dot O dot cichlid at gmail dot com. For those of you who'd like to support the channel, also be sure to use my Amazon link. And uh, to get to Amazon, anything you get from Amazon from my store or anywhere after you've used the link will give some credit to the channel. Your prices stay low. And also, if you would like a mug or a. Uh, a mug or a t-shirt or anything else, any of the channel uh, swag, be sure to go to the, the uh, Teespring and use Livestream for a 10% discount on all products at the Teespring store. And that is the end of the commercials. So <clears throat> thank you to all of you who support the channel and to those of you who show up. You're all appreciated quite a bit. Now, um, I have a topic today, which is uh, a little, a little. It is both uh, embarrassing, but also honest and upfront. And and part of fish keeping, it's not all. Um, it's not. All, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. I mean, you know that anyone who's kept fish for any length of time knows that um, things happen, and um, and they've certainly happened to me. And when you're, when you're on YouTube, you have a, um, you know, you sort of have a responsibility and you're sort of living, your fish are living in a glass house, but you're sort of living in a glass house too, uh, because things that happen become apparent and people ask, Hey, what happened to that fish? Hey, what happened to, or what's going on? Or, and so it's better. I have found it's better just to throw it out there. And put it out there. Now, before I go any further, can you folks tell me how's the picture and sound? And uh, give me a sound and picture check. You always have to. You always have to check here. Sound and picture. Any? Give me an idea. I'm looking at the chat now for your answer. By the way, I missed a couple super chats already. It looks like someone came in with what I think it looks like five pounds. But, oh, Emin. Emin Fountain. Not sure how long it'll, I'll be here for. We'll catch up later if Repairman arrives. I heard you're having some problems with your uh, with your connection. Sorry about that, Emin. Hope that gets fixed right away. Appreciate that. Appreciate that super chat. And um, so let's see here. Hey, Naomi H2O, audio and video are good. Thank you, Naomi. I appreciate that. And if you were here for my prior announcement, be sure to contact me if you would like a towel and some stickers, some channel stickers for that outrageous uh, super chat that you did, Naomi. Very appreciated. Very, very appreciated. I'm still a little bit overwhelmed. Hey, Denny. Denny's here. Thank you very much, Denny and everyone else for telling me about the sound and the video. Thank you so much. So let's get into the um, into the subject and the three the three uh, somewhat embarrassing but things that I learned from, and and this doesn't I'm not going to include the one that happened recently that um, which can only be classified as as having done or trying to do too much too soon, and um, I did I did put out a video on it, and it's the it's the um, and maybe one of the maybe one of the moderators can can bring up that video about what happened with the starry night and the red spotted severum uh one of the viejas and uh what 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 happened uh, on that one was i i just did too much i did too much to a tank i was treating it for uh what looked like a little bit of fin rot so there was an antibiotic in the tank i did a um uh an overhaul of some of the filtration and some cleaning. And, and what I did is I actually um, overwhelmed the tank with too much and I interrupted the, uh, I just messed with too much beneficial bacteria, created a, a, a short but deadly cycle in the tank with an ammonia spike. And I lost a couple fish right away. Uh, it quickly corrected itself. The beneficial bacteria caught up. 
I, uh, I, I realized what, what was going on. I, I, I moved some media from another tank, added some, some bacteria, but it was too late for a couple of the fish. And, uh, but I'm not going to, I didn't include that one in the three. I, I went back a little bit further. And, uh, and what I end up doing, the sequence is normally I, I make a mistake. I do something. I, I figure it out. And then I, I talk about it and I release a video, which is sometimes painful, <laughs> to be honest with you, <laughs> a little embarrassing. But I release a video talking about what occurred and um, why I think it occurred and what could have been done differently so that you folks don't make the same mistake. And um, the first one I'll talk about is... Um, is rushing into uh, sumps. I put a sump on a 150 gallon acrylic tank that I had in California. And I figured, you know, how complicated can it be? So I went ahead and I put the sump, I, I filled everything up with water and I started things going. And I, I, uh, I think I, I overflowed the tank. I overflowed the sump. I had a, a plumbing failure which resulted in water dumping out uh, from the tank, uh, from the bottom. And um, it, it was just, uh, and, and, I had, and I had a stand, I had a stand that wasn't lifted off the ground. It was, it was flat, you know, it was, it was flush to the floor all the way around the tank. And so what that resulted in was water seeping underneath the tank and me, because the, the stand had a floor on it, on the inside, I, I was not able to really get in there and mop that water up. Not without moving the tank. I put towels in there as far as I could. I ran a fan, but um, as you can see here, it resulted in some um, very serious, that was the six foot, six foot by two foot uh, uh, footprint of that 150 gallon tank after I sold it. And um, no matter how much I sandpapered and restained, I couldn't fix it. And I finally called a professional and the initial quote to try to match it up without lifting the floorboards. Uh, the best I could get was $800. So it was an $800 mistake. Uh, the house was leased. This was a leased house in Arcadia, California. And so um, I ended up having to uh, give the owner a check for $800 and, uh, so that he could have it repaired. And so uh, because of that, <laughs> I started studying sumps. I started asking people questions like Denny. Uh, Denny who's on today's uh, uh, live stream as one of the moderators. And I started asking a lot of people questions. I went to a lot of saltwater uh, websites that where they run sumps pretty regularly. And, and then, now I had tried to do some research before and I couldn't find, I couldn't find anything that made it simple where, where somebody who had never done sumps could go in and, and, and follow the steps. So what I ended up doing was releasing a series of videos that would help somebody. And there's a whole playlist on sumps, uh, both you know trickle down and traditional sumps. There's a whole playlist that I released so that someone like me can go and uh, someone who was like me before I got into sumps could go and watch and see how if you do it correctly, setting up a sump is actually very easy pretty easy. There's some labor involved, especially if you're doing hard plumbing like I did on this one. But, but the truth is, is that it's pretty easy. And, and it's a simple concept, but you have to understand the concept. You can't just, and, and I have a bad habit, and this has been my, <laughs> maybe because I've gotten lucky a few times, but I, I have a habit of jumping into things and, uh, having them blow up and then pull back and then go, okay, what did I learn? <laughs> and, 
and and then and then going ahead and and uh, trying it again. So um, so in the case of a sum, I don't suggest you do that. Uh, do a lot of research, gather information, and uh, watch some of these videos. Uh, one has forty three thousand views, so there, there's obviously some interest in in people in in sumps. And, and one is a newer one that was released four weeks ago, has 4,000 views. So there are people out there who want information about sumps because the truth is when I was setting mine up, it was a bit of a, a wasteland out there. I couldn't find, I mean, there were a lot of folks talking about uh, adding certain kinds of media or uh, uh, certain kinds of reactors and, uh, you know, things of this nature from the saltwater community. And they were all good. They all helped a little bit, but... I needed it to be done in second grade uh, level, and so I hope that some of the videos that I've that I've released are of second grade level, and any and someone can watch them, and then not have the fear. I mean, after I started, after I set up the sump, for about for about a week, I think I slept with like one eye open and my ears up, and if any little trickle, and, and I and I had a. We had a toilet down the hall that used to used to make a noise occasionally, and I would bolt up in bed and go, "Oh no, the sump's overflow." <laughs> it was a nightmare. <laughs> anyway, that's that's error number one: jumping into something without really knowing. And and you know you can apply this to anything: working on your car, uh, set, you know, setting up a canister filter. I have canister playlists. I have hang on black playlists. I you know. Uh, resealing a tank. I, I know that that uh, Jerry is resealing a big tank. There are videos out there on how to reseal a tank. Don't just jump into it. Uh, if you separate the glue in in attempting to remove the old silicone, if you if you get between the pieces of glass and you remove some of that, you're going to have a big problem. You're going to have you're going to have your panels separate. So there's a very specific way to remove the silicone so you don't disturb that adhesive. And, and then uh, apply the sealant. And um, I hope I just didn't scare Jerry. So, uh, <clears throat> so mistake number one was jumping into sumps without really thinking that I could just figure it out and, uh, and getting a real good hard knocks education. Good news is it resulted in a series of videos to help others not make the same mistake. Now, the next mistake. And this one, I'll tell you, um, uh, this one was painful for me. And it was, again, uh, a stoop, a, a, one of those I know better, but I'm going to wink at it this time, and it'll be okay. And what it was was I picked up some fish from a well-known, reputable spot in California. And um, brought the fish home. And the quarantine tank had a combination of fish that was resulting in one of them picking on one of the fish that was in quarantine. And, and so I thought that the tail damage, the damage that I was seeing on the tail of this one fish, I thought that was because he was being picked on in quarantine. And so I figured, you know what? It hasn't been a month. It's been only like a week and a half, but I'm going to pull this fish out and put him into a tank, one of my main tanks, where he's not going to be uh, harassed so much. Otherwise, his tail is going to get worse and worse. Big mistake. What I should have done was moved him into a smaller tank, into another tank, something small, a little five-gallon or something, and, and maybe treated him with a little bit of salt or something to help him heal up. Instead, I put him in the main tank, and he wasn't being picked on. What he had was the beginning stages of cholomeris. And for any of you out there who have dealt with cholomeris, it is uh, a bit of a death sentence. It wiped out 50% of my stock. And um, sometimes it'll show itself with a uh, stripe, a white stripe from the back of the dorsal that runs down the body. And uh, sometimes it'll, it'll look like rot on the, on the lips or tail. It can present itself a couple different ways. Sometimes it doesn't show anything. It handle, it attacks the organs, and the fish just falls over. And uh, 
So I, re I released a series of videos and uh, that talked about it, talked about how some of the um, initial medications were worthless and they didn't do anything. The disease just got worse and worse. And finally, I, I started using the uh, Fritz Marison Plus, and that stopped it cold, but not until after I had lost 50% of my stock. So, um, but I learned a lot. I learned about Colomeris and um, what it looks like. I also learned a hard lesson on sticking to a quarantine regimen. And um, I shared what I learned, not just in, in this video, but a couple other videos. Uh, I think one of them is actually called Colomeris. Uh, killer disease or something like that, Colomeris, killer disease. I have a disease playlist you can find it in. And um, I tell you, have some, Mar I don't even sure if you, not even sure if you can get Marison Plus anymore. You can get Marison. You need, a, I believe, a gram-negative antibiotic. Uh, General Cure is a, maybe a little bit too light. Uh, Furon 2 is, is, I believe, good. Marison Plus, uh, you can still get Marison. I'm not sure if you can get Marison Plus. I know for sure you can get it in the UK, Europe, um, you know, that the, those areas, I think they, 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 they've outlawed a lot of the stronger antibiotics. I don't know what you would do there. Add, add a lot of salt and pray, I guess. I don't know what you would do. Uh, or get black market antibiotics. I don't know what people do there when they get these serious fish diseases. That could potentially wipe out all your stock. But that was a difficult lesson. And, and you know, you, you talk about your fish, how much you, you love the way, like recently, how much I love that that uh, red spotted severum or that starry night and uh, that um, the tilapia. And, you know, you talk about these fish, you show them on Instagram and all of a sudden they're gone. They're gone. They're wiped out. And, uh, and you, you feel, you feel terrible. You feel terrible. Not, you know, not just because of the embarrassment of it, but because, you know, you really get attached to these fish and then half the stock gets wiped out. So good news. It resulted in a series of videos that I think have helped people to identify the signs of Colomeris and, and uh, help them attack it effectively more rapidly because the problem with that disease is it really, once it gets a hold in there, it's really hard to beat. And uh, one of the theories is that it, it, uh, it grows on, on uh, waste, fish waste, and so I had a, 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 um, I had a background, a 3D background. And 3D backgrounds over time can accumulate waste between the background and the back of the tank. And, and, and people who have 3D backgrounds, they don't pull that background back that often to get in there and vacuum. And when I, when I did the research and read that Colomeris can, can grow on waste, on fish waste, I pulled that background back and I had about an inch to an inch and a half of fish, accumulated fish waste that over a year had actually built up back there. So it actually soured me a little bit on art of, on the 3D backgrounds because unless you have them set up in a way where they're easy to pull back and get in there and clean, they will eventually just be a dump. They'll just be a, a dump yard where things will start to build up and even decor and rocks, rocks that are that are set deep in your substrate, pick them up sometimes. You look in there; it's amazing what it can build up under there. And if that's where columaris is, is if that's serving as a as a sort of petri dish, as a place for the columaris to duplicate itself, you definitely uh, want to keep those areas cleaned out. And so, uh, again, a very difficult lesson, but one that I hope you got something out of. <laughs> By my, from, from my suffering and expense. Um, you know, it reminds me of another one that's not, not on the list, and that was the, uh, my experiment with, with plants. You know, a couple of reputable fish keepers out there and I, that I respect, and I still respect them, uh, suggested Anubias for African cichlids. So I went out and spent about $100, put a bunch of Anubias, you know, 
everything from the small ones all the way up to the big, you know, the Nana, all the way up to the giant ones. And, uh, and it, it was great when the, when the cichlids were, were juvies, but once, once they got a little bigger, especially when I added some protomelis, man, they tore those plants up. They just tore them to death. And, and, uh, you know, moderators, you can find, you can find my video, the truth about the truth about live plants. I think it's called the truth about live plants. Go ahead and share that link. And, uh, you, you can you can see my uh, my hundred dollar experiment, and but I'll tell you something. For about a month, for about a month, that that uh, I think it was the hundred and thirty five gallon that I had. Boy, that tank was beautiful. That thing looked like a jungle. It was gorgeous, and and then the and then all of a sudden everything started to get shredded and shredded and shredded. And I think I ended up with with one little. Uh, I think it's on Rezone, one little Rezone stub from one of the Anubias that I pulled out and put into another tank. <laughs> anyway, my loss, uh, your gain. So, uh, so the last one, the last uh, number three, and I've given you, I've given you already what four, five, but the last one I'll give you is a mistake I made, and this goes, this this speaks to. That old saying, if it's working, if it's working, don't mess with it. And I, I will admit, I'm terrible. I, 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 I'm always tweaking and, and, and doing this and doing that. And part of it is because I want to try something and share it with you. And I want to test something and I want to, but you know, it's, if it's working, leave it alone. Unfortunately, leaving it alone is boring for YouTube content. <laughs> I'm bearing my soul here, too. <laughs> but so so somebody on YouTube, again, somebody I really respect, made a suggestion that we should position uh, wave makers, you know, power heads, uh, and and canister outputs in a way that creates a circular motion within the aquarium. And I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I get this water movement and it's uh, kind of uniform and um so what i did is i is i changed the the direction and and position of the um uh, of the outputs of these two canisters that i was running on a 60 gallon and this 60 gallon was was rocking i had in there one of the most beautiful fuscos i've ever seen the thing had that fish had red in his body it was a gorgeous fusco and a couple other fish that I've become very, very uh, attached to. A beautiful sunshine benga, and uh, it was a German red in there. And But at any rate, what ended up happening is I repositioned these, these power, these, 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 these outputs to create the circular motion of water, but in doing so, I dropped them below the waterline, and I created a, a surface that was calm, that wasn't being broken up. And um, the next morning, all of the bigger fish, the larger fish, like the Fusco, the Sunshine Benga, a couple other fish, that had the higher oxygen requirements were belly up. I think I lost six fish. Six fish were belly up. And uh, I contacted some of my favorite fish keepers, Jay Wilson, IFG, John Hudson. Back at, back then, uh, you know, I, I reached out to them, and I, what do you think? And and then all of a sudden, it it dawned on me what I had done, and uh, and I learned a very difficult lesson about oxygen and oxygen transfer. And and how just by running the water down through the canisters and back up to the tank doesn't really add any oxygen. You really have to have surface tension breakup so that the bad gas can leave and oxygen can get in, right? Your carbon, you know, your, your waste leaves and, and, and O2 can get into the water. Whether that's done by surface tension breakup 
or it's done by having bubblers that are causing surface tension breakup. Uh, but you've got to have surface tension breakup. I also learned that oxygen depletion has certain certain symptoms, such as the fish working their mouths, hanging out at the top, which if I had observed, if after making that change, see, I made the change late at night, and I went right to bed. If I had made the change and then, again, followed some of my advice, after any major change, be around and observe the tank. But I didn't. I went to bed. I would have observed that these fish were moving to the top because they were oxygen starved or that they were working their mouths hard. I would have observed that and I would have been able to take action. Instead, you go to bed, six to eight hours later you come out and that was too long. I also learned that an, ox an oxygen depletion or, or, or death because of lack of oxygen can be very confusing to a fish keeper because the oxygen will actually, the fish will die off to the point where there's enough oxygen for the remaining fish, and then the death, the death will stop because there's enough exchange going on to support the remaining fish, usually the smaller fish who, who are using less oxygen. So your big fish die off, and you end up with enough oxygen for the remaining fish, and you're scratching your head because you're, your water parameters are perfect. And now nobody's dying anymore. And so you're wondering, what the heck happened? Was there an ammonia spike? Was there... You don't know. It's very confusing. So at any rate, I figured it out. I did a lot of research. I released a series of videos. I've had a, a series of videos on oxygen. So that it doesn't happen to you. <laughs> But that was a hard lesson, especially that Fusco. Man, oh man, I love that fish. But at any rate, um, you suffer through these things. You go through this hard knocks. You think you know when you don't know. And I tell you, that's, that's probably the most dangerous thing in this hobby is, is thinking you know when you don't know. That's when you make the biggest mistakes. And uh, But, again... It forced me into a learning curve and then resulted in me releasing videos that ended up, I believe, looking at these 77,000 views, 4,000 views, and 9,000 views. You know, folks that have been helped by, uh, by what I went through. So, So let me hear what, what you folks have to say about this. And uh, I've, got the, uh, I've got the chat up here. And I'm going to go into the... Let's see here. If you have any... Have you been through something like this? If you've been through something where you learned something the hard way, go ahead and share it. I'd like to hear... I'd like to know that I'm not the only one that... The only one that has been through this. And uh, I'm going to scroll back through the chat here. If I missed any super chats, I'm sorry. Once I get on a roll. Let's see here. Hey, Sharpies. If you have any questions or any comments about what I've just talked about, let me know. And by the way, Jerry, I did see your question last week when I went back and reviewed the uh, live stream. I did see your question about uh, getting a YouTube channel going. Uh, I'll go over that with you privately because not a lot of folks that are on the video have a YouTube channel, but I'll be happy to talk with you about that privately. Uh, give me a call or let's, uh, let's exchange some emails and I'll go over uh, any questions you might have about getting your YouTube channel going. And Pompey Ranch, $4. Thank you, Pompey Ranch. Sorry I missed that earlier.
All right, let's see here. Uh, Gobrian44, whatever happened with the Santa Monica algae scrubber? I am going to be adding an algae scrubber to the sump on this 210. And I still have the algae scrubbers. I love the algae scrubbers uh, from Santa Monica Filtration for two reasons. And if the moderators want to um, want to share that uh, a link to that playlist on algae scrubbers, I think it's re uh, reducing nitrates naturally. I think it was one of the videos. But the algae scrubbers will create al or will, will grow algae in a controlled environment. They will also uh, uh, reduce your nitrates because the algae will consume nitrates. They add oxygen, right? Both with the bubbler and the algae itself. And once a week, you can pull the algae out and feed it to your fish because it's very, very nutritious. And a few of the fish that I had before, I remember a, a sunshine benga used to love the algae. And those clown loaches I used to have, they used to go crazy over that algae. So I probably will be adding the algae scrubbers uh, to this uh, sup, to this uh, sump. That was from Gobrian, Gobrian44. Pompeii Ranch, I'm also fiddling in my tank. Oh. <laughs> we're, we're all fiddlers, you know, we like to fit. <laughs> all right, let's see here. Okay, Sean. Sean says, if a tip I could give to anyone, I would say get a bag of Metro, and it's pronounced Metro Diazole flakes from Ken's fish, and give them to your fish every few months or so for a period of three days just to clean your fish out. So again, a little bit of a preventative medicine there. Uh, there's no, I don't, Sean, I don't think there's a better way to deliver antibiotics to your fish than in the food. And uh, some people soak their food in in uh, in Metro with focus, a little bit of garlic, so that they eat it. Uh, but you do waste some of the med meds that way. If you can buy meds that are infused with uh, medicine. And I did, I remember when I, when I did that Colomaris treatment, I, I also... Uh, I believe that I also was able to get rid of rid of it by adding by adding some food that was I, I went on eBay, I think. eBay had some flakes that were um gram negative, infused with gram negative antibiotics, and uh, that that helped a lot. I think that that together that together with the um with the Fritz product helped a lot. All right, I'm scanning the uh, Metroplex. Metroplex, I think, is one way to... It's called Metroplex as well. Together with Focus, you mix it with with something like Focus or Garlic Guard, something that'll make it more appealing for the fish to eat, and, and then you dump it in, and the fish eat it like crazy. It looks like uh, Calco, Calco L... I noticed my fish were all at the top of the aquarium and my parameters were okay. I had a wave maker and canister, not enough, so added a bubble maker and the fish were swimming normal after 15 minutes. Yeah, it, it's a very, it's a pretty quick, and again, like I said, if, if I had if I had taken the time to observe the tank after making the, any major change, right? If I had taken the time to observe the tank after making those changes, I would have seen that they had that they were moving especially the larger fish were moving to the top and working their mouths because the top is is more oxygen rich so um yeah 15 minutes i mean it's very fast how quickly uh it, you know it's amazing how fast they will respond and i'm just curious was your wave maker pointed to the top was it breaking up the top or was it moving water internally and you know you want internal movement That'll even out both temperature and oxygen, and it'll uh, pick up waste and move it to the inputs of your, uh, you know, of your filters. So you want that internal movement, but uh, sometimes if you have a strong enough wave maker, you can point it slightly up, 
and it'll give you both internal movement, but also break up the surface. And um, in my smaller tanks, I have a lot of bubbles going on with the Expertmatic uh, sponge filter powerhead combo. Also with some bubblers. In this tank, because of the enormous amount of surface tension breakup, with the the way I have the FX6 outputs pointed, I have a, a wave maker creating a lot of movement, and also the the cascading the cascading into the uh, sump. It super oxygenates the water. So uh, I don't have a bubbler in the big in this in this big tank. So let's see here. Alyssa Sandoff, how can I increase the general hardness of my water without raising the pH and alkalinity? pH is already 7, 8. Well, first of all, if, if, you, have, if you have African cichlids, Alyssa, they can tolerate a higher pH than that very easily if you raise it gradually. Uh, the, um, you can add things like limestone, Limestone is a uh, will release uh, minerals, will release calcium, magnesium on a regular basis. So limestone, using limestone as a decor, uh, things like aragonite, uh, perhaps depending on the size of your tank, uh, add ten percent of uh, coral, crushed coral. Crushed coral is really good. Carib Sea sells uh, crushed coral. You can buy it from other sources too on eBay. Uh, crushed coral works well. Aragonite works well, and also uh, also limestone. Melinda Lee Bowley says, no, your fish will build antibiotic resistance. That's interesting. So for those of you who are medicating uh, preemptively or in as a uh, precautionary, and I know that uh, there's been some controversy. I know that... Uh, there's a combination of meds that Corey over at the Aquarium Co-op recommends to to hit the fish with in quarantine. Now, he's importing fish very often that are uh, directly from the lakes and rivers. He's importing them from, um, you know, Southeast Asia and far away, and they can come with very unusual diseases and parasites. So certainly when you're importing fish, probably a great idea to go ahead and hit them with some... Uh, uh, you know, deep, you know, with some parasite meds, antibiotics, things of that nature. Now, for the guy who buys from the local breeder, should that person put a fish through that regimen? Again, that's an interesting topic. Um, are you over-treating? Are you creating a situation like was brought up by Melinda about uh, about fish building up antibiotic resistance and then when you do need to treat them for something that is apparent are those fish not going to respond because your antibiotics are too weak we see it with humans you have super bacterias now that are uh, unfortunately prevalent in hospitals you go in there for a uh, a minor procedure you end up getting a flesh-eating bacteria that doesn't respond to antibiotics and you're in a world of hurt so um why is that? Because we've been using so much antibiotics for everything. You go into a doctor, you have a scratchy throat, they give you antibiotics. The doctor didn't take some kind of a sample to see if it was viral. If it's viral, antibiotics will do nothing. If it's bacterial, yes, but we've been handing out antibiotics like candy, and now there are superbugs out there that, uh, that are pretty scary. So... Um, I usually and Jerry, you know, I, Jerry, I, I, I quarantine, I quarantine without, without anti, without antibiotics unless I see something. If I see something, I'll hit it and I'll extend the quarantine period to be one month from the time I don't see any more signs of the disease. But if I don't see any disease, and again, I'm buying locally and from reputable vendors here, usually locally or in the states, I'll quarantine for a month. If they're healthy, colorful, active, interacting with me, eating well, uh, after a month, I'll transfer them to the main tank. Mike Dash Poppy? 
Mike, is that Poppy for Spanish for Dad? Poppy? I know in Puerto Rico we call Dad Poppy. And my mother used to call me Poppy when I was a baby. <laughs> At any rate, uh, the part of the things I love, one of the things I love about, about hang on back filters is that they do break up the water. They break up the water tension, the surface tension. So they do oxygenate quite a bit. And uh, it, it's, it's uh, just one of the benefits of a hang on back. Now, if your tank is heavily stocked and you have a pretty, a pretty sealed up top like I do on the 90 gallon, the 90 gallon, I have a very thick piece of plexi on the top because uh, the viejas can be jumpers. So uh, because I have it so sealed up, not only do I have the two hang-on backs, but I also have a very large air stone in there. So uh, being being uh, you know being provided air by a a two output fluval with a two into one gang valve, so both of those are going into one very big dish, a disc of air stone that is really oxygenating the heck out of that tank. And I know there's a little bit of a, uh, there's been a controversy in oxygenation about does the, do the bubbles oxygenate? And I know Kevin Green and I talked about this before. Uh, do the, does, do the bubbles oxygenate as they travel from the stone up the column? Do they provide oxygen there or are they providing oxygen only when they break up at the surface? And, uh, I know there's been a little bit of a debate about that. I think Corey at the co-op me mentioned that he felt that, this, that there was oxygen being added as they traveled up. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> All right. Any more comments, questions? I noticed none of, uh, very few of you were willing to uh, share some of your embarrassing uh, mistakes. That's okay. I'll keep sharing mine. <laughs> you can keep yours a secret. That's okay. <laughs> That's totally okay. All right. Um, there's a... Um, yeah, people throw around these terms. G-H, K-H, P-H... Right? I mean, we're all familiar with ammonia, nit nitrite, nitrate, right? And uh, you start talking about GH and KH, and a lot of people go blank. I do have a video on uh, KH and GH and uh, that you can watch. It's a bit, it can be a little bit confusing. And uh, I have a very un unusual situation here in Tennessee where I get water that is off the chart hard, very, very hard. And I have a medium to low uh, KH. So I have to work on. This is why there's there's uh, there's coral. There's coral and uh, aragonite and, and in the uh, in the South American tanks to help bring up some of the carbonate carbonate hardness. And by the way, just so you know, I've been using I've been using some of the test strips from the uh, aquarium co-op, and I'm really liking those strips. I haven't done a side by side comparison against an API kit. I found that the API master kit was giving crazy nitrate readings, and I found the readings to be more true on some of the other kits, like the CCAM uh, nitrate kit. Uh, so I think Salifert. Salford has a uh, nitrate reading kit. I did a comparison once in a video. I found that they were giving me uh, what I felt were more accurate readings. And so, but I am finding, uh, I am really liking using the, uh, the aquarium co-op test strips. If you want to get a real fast uh, measurement and, uh, and don't want to go through the entire uh, test tube, test kit process, uh, check out the, uh, the, the test strips from the aquarium co-op. 
I'm really liking I'm, I'm liking using those, and I have been using them on a pretty regular basis as I've, I've I, as I've gotten these these tanks up and running. Giru the robot is it Giru Jiru? The robot admits that he flooded his house. <laughs> did you flood? Did you flood a uh, carpet or hardwood, or was it just a a, a tile? A tile surface. If I have a flood, if I have a flood here in the garage, it's just a concrete floor with a coating, with a very strong coating. So a flood here doesn't matter. But as you saw with that, with that, uh, in that prior house that I was leasing, I'm telling you that hardwood floor got was was just was just destroyed. And and uh, and I really hope that that person that gave the quote was able to bring that floor back. I do know by checking on Zillow, I do know that the house was leased shortly after we left. So he must have been able to fix it. So I hope so. So at any rate, we're getting into the wind down here. I want to thank all of you for, for joining me today. And I want to thank in particular those of you who uh, chipped in on the Super Chat. Thank you for that. If I missed you, I'm sorry. Sometimes when I get going, I don't look at the chat. I also want to thank my moderators, uh, the best moderators on YouTube. And uh, I'm not sure, it was Kevin Green here today? I'm not sure. But certainly uh, Denny, Jerry, GP, and Zen, uh, you folks, your help is greatly, greatly appreciated. And um, if you would like to be a moderator, like I noticed, Naomi, you're showing up pretty regular. If one of you folks would like to be a, a moderator, let me know. Send me an email. It's very easy to make you a moderator, and that uh, allows you to help keep an eye on the chat and uh, also sometimes uh, dig up some links and things like that. But I thank you all for helping on the moderators. And uh, I'm going to try and get a video out uh, this coming week on a tank review. I'm going to be reviewing a tank by Heiger. And uh, I, I finally got some plants from Aquarium Co-op. I'm also uh, asking for some uh, Anubias from oh, my friend James over at the Cichlid Shack and also some small fish. I'm going to put some small fish in a planted tank. I'm going to put it in my wife's office so that the kids that she tutors can see the tank over her shoulder when she's tutoring them. I think it'll be very uh, just a lot of fun for the kids that she tutors. She tutors anywhere from four-year-olds all the way up to uh, uh, pre-college high schoolers. So um, she tutors them virtually. So um, that's it for me, my friends. Thank you so much for showing up. Uh, share the link for the live stream for those folks that missed the live stream. They can catch it on the replay. Never forget, you, uh, you rock, my friends. You're the best. I appreciate your support of the channel. And uh, that's it for me. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.